Welcome to Collecting Recollections at the Ringling Museum. My name is Dwight Curry. Um, this is our third and final in a, a series of conversations uh, under the title of Beauty and the Beasts, uh, which uh, are conversations with legendary female animal trainers in the circus. And today, our guest is Kay Rosaire. She is an eighth generation member of one of the world's most respected and acclaimed circus families. And we're going to talk uh, with Kay today about that extraordinary legacy, plus ask her to share her memories of more than 25 years of internationally acclaimed uh, work as an animal trainer, and then to also tell us about the very important conservation work that she is now doing on behalf of Royal Bengal and Siberian tigers and African lions at her big cat habitat and Gulf Coast Sanctuary. So join me in welcoming Kay Rosaire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like I said, uh, the program today is being uh, video archived for the museum's archives, and that is where every collecting recollection begins for me. I, uh, I asked Debbie if I can come over or if she will pull for me the file uh, for today's guest, um, and she does, and then I get to take those files back to my office that has all kinds of information uh, that's been collected over the years by our archives. Um, and this time, I, Debbie brought the files over, and there was an abnormally large file marked uh -oh. K. Rosaire. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is, this is going to take some time to get through. And then she handed me an equally large file marked The Rosaire Family. So I spent Thanksgiving reading about you oh. and your family. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was a great way. Um, and so I want to begin uh, with The Rosaire Family. Um, you're the eighth generation. That's there right. are nine generations going on ten. Yes, my grandchildren. Performers that, and I read in the file, trace your history back to England's royal court jesters. That's right. That's great. So I'm going to start with that family. And I, this is an impossible question. Gonna, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, the earliest reference I found said that the Rosaire story of circus performers started in 1840 as a family of jugglers and stilt walkers. Actually, among that, that was that sort of came a little bit after. But before that, my great 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 grandfather was a, a boxer, and he, they did a thing that they called fight all comers. So they would literally go to a little town, and they would mix among the people, and they would say, "This is our best boxer that we have, and anybody that can beat him will get a certain amount of money." And that was a way to get the people interested because it was an event. And then they decided, after they did that for many years, and he actually became the champion of England, and it was bare, bare, yeah, it was bare terrible. Bare knuckle, bare fist. Yeah, he would just knock a guy out, and that was it. He wouldn't hurt him, you know, just knock him out, get it <laughs> over with. And uh, so then they decided that it was too short, because he didn't want to hurt them, he just wanted to get him out. Show's over, so then they started adding other elements of entertainment to it. Sort of dressed and of it course, up. in England, they already had the horses, and that became part of it. Part and, of the whole thing. Yeah. When I was reading the Rosaire family file, it, you know how you get those historic novels, and there's that very handy family tree in the back. I, I had to start making one of those as, as a who was who was oh who gosh. and who was whose daughter or sibling. Uh -huh. Do you have any idea in the 175 years since 1840 mm -hmm. how many of your grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, second cousins, nieces, nephews, how big is the Rosaire family? Well it was really really big back in those days because obviously there was no birth control. <laughs> And Rosaires are very affectionate people. <laughs> and uh, my parents had, uh, on each side of my parents' families, there were eight children. So that's a circus almost right there. <laughs> and so those uh, people had children too. So we, it kept being bigger and bigger. So it, was, it must have been enormous. So you had cousins. I mean, I have cousins all in Ireland because my, my mother's name was Kays. 
And Kay's brother's circus was an Irish circus. Oh, she was a circus family too. Oh yeah, and going back the same way, many generations. Matter of fact, if you go back far enough, they're all related. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it, the tree is like uh, the the bakers and the faucets and the yeldings and and you know they're all the British circus families did intermarry, so. In a way, all the British circus families are all related to each other, so it's vast. And there was a Rosaire circus yes. in England. And that was because they had so many, there was eight of them, and they were all very gifted. One, two of my aunts actually were over here on Ringling back in the 30s, and I didn't know that until a few years ago. They did aerial contortion, and they were fabulous, the Rosaire sisters. I, I think they had another name, but they were here for a while, went back to England. But... Uh, they all had different talents, so they fulfilled the whole show. Wow. And my dad actually originally was a, an acrobat. And when he was 18, he did the rings, you know, where they do all the, like now it's gymnastic yeah. competition. But in those days, it was a performance. And he did a dismount and landed on his heels and broke his back. A very bad break. And at that time, when you broke your back, you were finished. You, 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 you died. But they took him and they did experimental surgery. They took the bone out of his shin and put it in his spine and put aluminum, which was a brand new type of metal that they had in those days, and put an aluminum plate in his leg and a new aluminum plate in his back. And he was actually written up in the medical books. So after that happened, he was, you know, he was two years in the hospital. Wow. And during uh, the war, they actually took him to different military hospitals when he recovered and had him do round off flip flop backs down the ward to show the people that even a spinal break could be fixed and to have hope. And so he, that was what he did as he recovered. Oh, that's a great he, story. He would go and do handstands and chin ups and show him that he's, you know, back Still at robust. It. But after that, he, he really focused on animals. And that's how we became an original animal family, not a family like I never did aerial. I did web because I had to when I was a kid. Did what? Web, you know, the aerial web. No, I don't know. It's a production number that they put in all shows. Oh, okay. And it pays very well. <laughs> <laughs> I think $50 a week for risking your life 70 feet up in the air. It was ridiculous. So I, I never wanted to do anything other than animals. So that's why I went with the to big animals. animals. So I wouldn't have to do any of that. Did you know your grandparents? Did you yes. ever see them perform? They, no, I didn't see them perform because when I remember my grandma, she was in her 80s. Okay. And she would show up. We traveled all over Europe. My father never left us in boarding school. He, he, he always said that if he didn't want children, he wouldn't have had any. Because most of the English performers that did theater and other shows during the winter in Paris and wherever, in right. all over London, in all the th we did theaters. He did theaters all summer. Uh, he wouldn't leave us. He said no. And a matter of fact, he turned down an offer to go on Ringling years ago because they wouldn't let children on the show at the time. You had to stay in boarding school. And so we always stayed as a family and traveled all over the world. That's better than going to boarding school. Oh, heck yeah. I don't, um, I don't think we'd have lasted anyway. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the file, uh, there's, some, there's some great photocopies. And I came across, was Fred your grandfather? Yeah, my grandfather. There was a, there's a great photograph. With the of, goose. With the goose, Fred and his goose. Did he have yeah. a trained goose? He had a goose that just, well, goose and ducks fall in love with you. If, you, Ray, if, you, if you're the first one they see out of the egg, you're mom or dad. And he had this huge goose, and he wasn't particularly friendly to people, but he would follow my granddad all day long. And I remember it vividly because I used to watch him walk down to the pub. There was a pub in Billericay where we lived, <laughs> where we had a circus farm there. That was the winter quarters for the Rosé Circus. And you'd see the goose outside the pub waiting for my granddad. <laughs> so he couldn't, he could never get away. The goose was always at somebody's house or at, at the pub or somewhere. So my grandmother was up, bloody goose is over there. Go get your father. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you did see your, your parents perform. Oh, yeah, very much. Do you much. remember that first Recollection? Well, we were, when we were children uh, in England, like I said, we did circus all summer. We, always were in, we were always in there, you know. We used to hassle the town kids for going under the tent. That was our sport. Uh-huh. 
and uh, but friend them and get them in, you know, and all that. And then, did you ever perform with the Rosaire Circus in England? No, I was too young. I was too only young. twelve when we came to the U.S. Okay. Um, but well, I remember my mom and dad, and and the wonderful part of it was is we were in both worlds, theater and circus, because my mother's uh, on my grandmother's side, they were theater people. Her mother was a piano player, and they did musical theater. So my dad had the in with the theater, and we worked with Laurel and Hardy when I was a kid. And I was about probably five or six years old when we worked with Laurel and Hardy for a whole winter season, and they were big, huge stars. And, 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 and they would have a kid's show in the daytime. They call it pantomime, which always has a theme, Peter Pan or whatever. And uh, then at night, the big uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis would be there, or Bob Hope. And wow. Yeah, it was pretty cool at the, all, the, all the Palladium and all the big theaters. So we, and matter of fact, Petula Clark, Clark was our babysitter. Her parents, were, <laughs> her parents were singers, and they always had a couple of singers, a comedian, and somebody that played the xylophone, and tap dancers, and an act. You know, it was like a variety show. And also, um, the other famous one from... Uh, Julie Andrews, her parents were performers, and she used to watch us. Because she back. started very young, too. Yeah, and we literally did have the, 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 the big thing that we could lay down in in the dressing room, you know, the trunk. Uh-huh. That was, tr there were trunks. There were trunks. There were definitely <laughs> trunks. Well, the story of the Rosaires in America begins with your father coming right. with uh, Tony, Tony, the, Tony Wonder the Wonder Horse, Horse yeah. which I'm pretty sure I saw that on Ed, Ed Sullivan. Sullivan yeah. That's why you came to this country, it was for the Ed Sullivan show, right? I don't think we came specifically for that, but he had had uh, inf you know, inquiries before we came for that, but we actually left, we were in England with the Moscow State Circus, which was a big honor then because it was Moscow, it was a right. Russian circus, and they, they hired my dad as the specialty act for the big date at the Wembley Stadium. And while we were there, Hamid came over and a lot of big producers came over. And I think the people from Ed Sullivan then. And my dad wasn't going to go all the way to America for one TV show. Did, you know. did people know in England who Ed Sullivan was? I mean, they didn't broadcast over there, Probably did they? not, because uh, during that time, we went to Italy after that. And I remember when the first TV showed up on the show. And we all stood outside somebody's trailer looking in the door to black and white TV for a few minutes a day, you know. It was, look at it, it's amazing, you know. Yeah. So I don't think England, I don't think everybody had televisions then. No. But when we came here, it was a couple of years after we were here that he did the Ed Sullivan show. Then it was a big deal. So tell us about Tony the Wonder Horse. Well, it was always a, it, it was a neat thing. And we've done this throughout of our work with animals. We always work as partners with the animals. They're not like an animal that we're forcing to do something and making them, you know, do tricks that they don't want to do. It's not like that. We kind of work with the animals and see what they like to do and kind of just play them through it. And so the horse and my dad was a, always a competition between the horse's intelligence and my dad. <laughs> so my dad was basically the fool. The horse made a fool of him, which people love that, you know. I yeah. mean, who, do, who wants to see an animal going, oh, I hate this guy, you know. You want to see him out, get out of here and push the guy, you know. Yeah. And my dad did a lot of physical comedy with him. And it was funny because in England he dressed as a cowboy because it was a novelty to be a cowboy with a horse in England. And when we came to this country, he wore top hat and tails because <laughs> it was cooler to be from England than to be a cowboy. Well, I think that the circus always... You want it to be exotic. You yeah, want yeah, it to yeah. be something yeah. other. So yeah. that, that, I guess that stands to reason. Yeah. And it was a wonderful, funny... My dad was a, an amazing comedian, naturally. He was just... A, and my son, Clayton, if any of you... I know some of you have been to the Habitat and seen our, our presentations there. My son is equally funny. He just has that... He makes everybody laugh. That's fun. Yeah. Um, so you came to uh, the U.S. in 1960. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that transition? Was it hard for you? Were you thrilled to be in the United States? Did you want to go home? It was or? kind of strange because we'd seen a lot of movies in, in, in Europe. We used to go to movies a lot as kids. They had serial movies, right. with cowboy movies and all that. And we were not really aware of what was going on in the rest of the world because we lived in a trailer in the lot in the middle of a town or wherever we were. We assimilated wherever we went. We ate the same food. We, it's not like being a tourist. You kind of become part of the population. So whatever country we were in, that was what we knew about. We didn't have media and all what we have now. We, d we had no clue. 
So when we came to America, we came on a ship called the Queen Frederica from, from Italy, from Circotoni. So when we got to New York, we thought we were going to see horses and cowboys <laughs> and, you know, dirt streets and a Western movie, Laredo. basically. Yeah. And we, we came out and we, were, we looked off the ship and there's cars and it's just like everywhere else. And we were like, whoa, what happened, you know? It was like a weird kind of a, yeah. thing, like, it's not that like, and it, funnily enough, years uh, later on when we went further out west, we saw that. Right. We still had places in Montana and South Dakota where they did have dirt streets and horses tied up at the rail. And where did so you... we got some of that. Where in America was the fir your first home? Trenton, New Jersey, which New was Jersey. horrendous at the time. <laughs> At the time. And Bob Atterbury, <laughs> show people know this guy, he's, an, he's notorious, Bob Atterbury, he was a real criminal, really. Now he would be arrested immediately, but in those days he was the manager of the show. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> anyway, uh, he showed up to pick us up in New York and he had a pink Cadillac, a big, loud pink Cadillac with these huge wings, and he had a wrinkled up old overcoat that was full of, he looked like he slept in it, and he had one brown shoe and one black shoe. And we were all there dressed, you know, in our little outfits to get off and go to the new world. And my, my dad leaned over and said to my mom, what do you think, should we stay on the boat? <laughs> and my mom, who was always very positive and confident, said, no, it'll be all right, don't worry, it'll be fine, you know, and it, it was bizarre. So and then they took us to a hotel in Trenton and the floors were all crooked. You know, and they, they had a machine you could put a quarter in and watch TV for a few minutes. It was bizarre. <laughs> well, I'm going to turn, uh, you know, now to your career as a performer. And um, I always like uh, if we can define some of these things, because if you can't tell, I don't really know anything about circus. So that's why I get to I ask think the you questions. Do. I think you must have learned something. Well, I'm, I'm learning. But yeah. um, you and your sisters had a high school Horse act. What's a uh -huh. high school horse act? That's where you do movement, movement, movements of the horse. You ride the horse, and he does marching and double marching and different steps. It's like the, what the lipizans do. Oh, okay. Only it's not a lipizan, and and it's more theatrical for a circus. So, what was your act like? Your high school we act. We did. We dressed like Robin Hood, and uh, we had fun with it. We had, we had, we rode Arabian stallions, and we did a three ring display, and we did a lot of hind leg stuff, and. My dad was an amazing uh, trainer of any animal. He could just take any animal. We, you know, we had Gentle Ben the Bear and yeah. Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion and all of that. And so the horses were preliminary. When I was in high school, I actually taught riding and show road and did all of that stuff. And was that still in New Jersey? No, that was in Waterford. We, of all things, we were in Erie, Pennsylvania in August, and it was beautiful. And my dad's best friend, Merle Cook, who had Cook's Comedy Car, I don't know if you filmed... It was a very famous comedy car. It was a Model A Ford. And this still exists, actually. His son is the third generation working the same act right now. And um, anyway, he lived in Erie, Waterford, Pennsylvania. And my dad was his best friend. And we stayed there for a couple of weeks. We had a little bit of time off. So my dad bought 55 acres in Erie, Pennsylvania, not knowing that it was terrible, cold, and in the <laughs> snow belt, you know. Yeah, right on the... It was a big mistake on the lake, they called it. So come winter, here, actually the end of September, my mom went to open the door of the house, and it wouldn't open, it was snow. And uh, my mother said, where are we? What, are, what have we done here? Are we in the snow? You know? <laughs> and we would talk to people in Sarasota, and they'd be saying, oh, we're going to play tennis. Yeah. So yeah, but we already bought the place cash, you know. So you had fifty-five acres in area. Yeah, but we actually it was a really great time because that's the time when we had General Ben, and he was at the Erie Zoo, and that's what gave us exposure to even more animals. We'd always been around every kind of animal our whole life. We, Circus Kinney in Switzerland has a, an amazing array of exotic animals. Which circus? Circus Kinney. Kinney. We were on Kinney, and we. My dad played all the. Wonderful shows. How many countries did you travel? Most of them. I, I don't, wow. You know, I mean, we never knew, you know, where we were going to be. My dad, we had this, my dad, I think he invented the motorhome. <laughs> you know, he made this huge house out of a, a double-decker bus that had rooms upstairs for the kids, and downstairs he had, you know, living quarters for him and my mom. And then later on he made one out of like a big bookmobile kind of a thing. 
And at that point, when we traveled around Europe, we actually had the horse and the dogs in the back of the bookmobile. With you? With yep. us. And the horse, it, and, and my, while we were in Spain, my dad bought another Andalusian horse. So the horse had been behind the door, and the dogs and everything, a chimp, were all back in the back part. Well, when he got the second horse, he had nowhere to put it. So he, he opened the door, he cut a hole in the floor of the motorhome, and because the horse was at a lower level, because you uh -huh. have to bring them in, you know. Yeah. And the horse was in the living room while we were traveling. The horse was right in the living room. And that's how we traveled around Spain. <laughs> 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 it was crazy. People would watch us unload, you know, and there'd be a kid and another kid and another kid and 31 Pekingese and a horse. 31 Pekingese. And another horse and a chimp. <laughs> It was pretty, uh, it was pretty... Were all 31 Pekingese in the act at, at, at the same yeah, time? Yeah, my mom had a very famous Pekingese act called uh, Betty, Betty Kay's and her Pekingese, and she had 31 Pekingese, and it was, it was, they were beautiful, and she was excellent with them, you know. And they would all run all over the stage. It was, it was, my cousin David has a wonderful Pekingese act now. <laughs> but in those days, that was quite a thing to see that many Pekingese, you know. yeah. And they were all different colors, and they loved to work. They were very yappy and cute. But they were so well-trained because when you played the theaters, they couldn't bark. You know, you've got plays going on and singers. And oh, you mean backstage. So backstage, mean. they can't bark. They have to be quiet. And they were so good. My mom would say, quiet. And they were just, they like knew. It was amazing. Uh, you mentioned the web. Yes. Did you do, uh, besides the, the horse act, did you no, do any well, other? No, well, I worked a lot of little animals, uh, llamas and, you know, penguins. I actually worked a penguin act for my dad. We had a tank, and they swam, and I started with penguins. Yeah, we've, we've trained everything that there was at the zoo we trained. <laughs> were, you over there? Yeah, was... we were there. It was like an education. So when and why did you turn personally to the big cats? Because at the time that we had General Ben, we also had the new Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion from the TV show. Does everybody movies. remember? Those are not everybody, at least people. Yeah. Well, he, he came to live with us uh, one year when we were in Erie, and everybody gets an assignment. And I said, I'll, I want to take care of the lion, you know. And my uncle, Tommy Case was a very famous lion trainer in England in the 30s. And um, he actually... Uh, did a show on a stage in a square arena, and it was a, apparently very exciting. Women would faint in the audience and stuff because they would get nervous. And uh, so I knew all those stories of my uncle, so I already had a keen interest in big cats. I thought they were beautiful. I always watched the cats on the shows. Every show we were on, I always used to come and watch the cat act and very interested in it. And then when I took care of the lion, I just completely fell in love with lions and... Um, that was that was it for me. Did you? Uh, that was on uh, Doc Tari. Did, did you have any other animals on that? Well, we had the chimps. My sister Pam handled the chimps. She still works with chimps. chimps. But we had already had our own chimps prior to that. So it was just a kind of a natural thing. And then, of course, my brother fell in love with the bear. Yeah. Um, you were uh, your act was billed <laughs> as the only woman in the world to put your head in the lion's mouth. Yeah, which was the easy part. Getting it out was the... <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. How do you, I mean, just how do you go about training a lion to let that... I mean, you've you well, got to put I, your I hands had, in there first, Yeah, right? I had done it with a male lion, and unfortunately I didn't have him very long, and he was wonderful, and just playing with him every day and learning to trust each other and put your hand in their mouth, and they... They, they are naturally very oral because they bite each other and they play with each other. And the, the difference is you have to teach them not to actually clamp down because they do yeah. bite each other pretty hard. But they have a hide. They have a very thick hide with very tight hair. So it's not easy to penetrate a hide. The skin is a lot easier, as I've discovered over the years. And uh, so... As you're playing with them and, and working with them and developing this bond that you have to have, <clears throat> you know, no mere woman's going to control a 675-pound lion. No. You're not going to bully it into submission. That's completely not going to happen. So you, <clears throat> are you actually holding the jaws open? Yeah, and you just start when they're little. People do it with their dogs. I see people doing it with their dogs all the time. They'll open their mouth and put it on them. 
and it's part of a play thing and then you just routine it and they know when it's coming they they actually the animals are so much more intelligent than anybody even ever assumes they are they're they're just way on a different level as far as knowing what's coming up and you know they, yeah. they really do uh you know my animals i my set group of animals that i worked i worked them for over 20 years they the same animals because they were healthy, they were cared for properly, they got plenty of exercise. I spent every my whole days with them, you know. You were attacked, though, once in the rain, yes, right? Yes, I was, yeah. Do you want to remember that, or do you want to forget that? No, I do, because it shows the, the reality of how they... It doesn't matter how many generations. You know, people always think, oh, wild animals. There are no wild animals working. They're, they're, these animals are born in captivity, the cats that I worked with were many generations born in captivity. They were still feisty and still tigers, but captive born, not like the wild ones. The wild yeah. ones were a whole different kind of a character. As a matter of fact, the old trainers would never break the, the fire line with the, with the cat. They would never have contact with them. What's that mean, the fire line? Well, there's a certain line that protects you from cats, and they usually have a stick and they won't come past the stick. There's a... <laughs> Oh. And like body, almost with people too. There's sort of an air. You don't get right in somebody's. Does that face. have to do with their reach or just what's comfortable it's, with the it's animal? It's sort of where you set the boundaries. Oh, okay. As you do it with kids too. You, there's always boundaries, you know. Yeah. And and so, um, <clears throat> where were we? I forgot now. Well, we were, we were talking about. Um, oh, we were talking about the attack. Oh yeah. So, um, but even though these are captive born, there's a, a still always a pecking order. That's what. That's what it's all about. There's a alpha male, alpha female. And I had a very strong alpha female. She was, she was the only one that ever had cubs accidentally. I had two cubs born one night after the show. And she was, that was the only time she was sweet in her whole life. She was just not a nice girl. <laughs> and some people are not nice, by the way, if you know that. <laughs> so she was always kind of the alpha, I want to show you I'm the boss kind of an animal. Uh -huh. And... Um, Yet when she had the cubs, she would let me take them out and, and take care of them, put them back after the show, and she'd lick my hand. She was very, we worked it together. But she, when she come in, came into estrus, she was always very aggressive. They, they kind of change. So she was always in competition. And I had had another cat that kind of kept her in her place because she didn't like her coming towards me. She would try to come behind me. Just, it's like cat... It, they don't really do it thinking, well, I'm going to get her and she's going to die and she'll be gone and I'll, I'm going to be free in the wild. That, that's not going on. What's going on is I'm an alpha female and I'm going to show her I'm the boss today, not thinking that she's going to kill me and eat me because she's treating me like another tiger. Okay. You know, it's just like being part of this pack. Yeah. So uh, consequently, um, she decided she was going to get me. And I was having a bit of a slow day, I will admit. I was up a little late the night before. And I was over with Munchie, and Munchie used to lick my arm. She was the one I put my head in the mouth. And I, I calculated it throughout the career that we worked together, probably 13,000 times right <laughs> around that. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Anyway, um, she decided to try me, and she came. I was not paying attention to her because I was with Munchie. And I turned and looked at her seat, and it was empty. And that's a really bad feeling. Because <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know it where she all, was. It was already empty, and I knew where she was. She was right behind me. And she grabbed me by the hip and knocked me down. Grabbed uh, you? With her mouth. With her mouth. Oh. Yeah. It was like getting hit by a car with teeth, basically. Yeah. Because don't forget, she weighed close to 450 pounds. She was pretty, and solid muscle. She did all the jumping. She was a lively, beautiful, healthy cat. And um, so she knocked me down, and I luckily I was able to, when I went down, I was able to hit her in the nose with my elbow. She had me right here, and she let me go, went around and grabbed my leg and started to drag me. And my big male lion leads, God bless him, saved my life. He actually came down, straddled me, hit my top of my head with his muzzle, and he was huge. His head was massive. I used to ride on him. I mean, my feet were this far off the ground. He was huge. Wow. He actually came up over my waist, and I'm five foot six. So anyway, um, 
he came down, straddled me, actually hurt my neck quite a bit because he, he hit me on the head and he hit her and she flew and landed over there and that, and then he ju jumped off of me and just kind of went, ooh, ooh, you know, like he ma actually made a, a sound like a, what's going on, I'm, you know, he was afraid. And I said, it's okay, get on your seat and he got back on his seat and she came again, she came back. And luckily, I stood up and I had my stick and my whip, and I was able to get her back on her seat. And then my husband at the time came around, and we got him out, and I went to the hospital. But the bizarre f and kind of funny part of it is the man that booked me for this show, it was in Canada. I'm waiting, I'm laying on a picnic table in front of my trailer. The trailers are where we live are always right by the animals. We never leave the animals alone for obvious reasons. We're always right there. So I'm laying on the picnic table in my costume, bleeding, not real bad because the teeth are serrated, so it kind of seals it off as they bite. And uh, wow. I'm laying on my stomach, and here comes the ambulance, and they go right past me, and they go down, and they take the owner of the show because he had a massive heart attack <laughs> when he saw what happened to me. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> yeah, I know, that was, I was like, hello. <laughs> and uh, so, so finally, um, uh, quite a bit later, I think they only had one ambulance because they had to take him and come back. And they took me there, and I waited four hours laying on my stomach with my whole thing hanging out, and it was like a pocket in my hip. Ah. And But not a lot of blood. And everybody in the hospital came in, and, and in, it was French. Oh, mon Dieu, regarde ça. Oh, c'est terrible. Oh, look what happened. You know? and, I'm, and I'm like, can I get a Tylenol or something? And... <laughs> Is there any way you can not freak me out anymore? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> you know? But it was, I was so lucky. I, it happened to be that the, the guy on call that night in the emergency who saved my friend, thank God, from the heart, I would have felt worse over that, uh, was a plastic surgeon, and he did such a phenomenal job. Wow. And I had tubes, you know, drainage tubes in my legs and, and my back, my hip, and I was out for about 10 days. Did and he recover from the heart attack? Yes, he oh, did. Good. He did, and it, it He was, probably uh, wanted you to do that every... Uh, well, he got a lot of good reviews. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, thought, they actually thought that it was part of the show. A lot of people said, what an exciting show that was. And all of your siblings were animal trainers, or are animal are. trainers. Yeah. And animal lovers, you know, we're not... I think, you know, people have a, a funny perception, and I know we've had bad animal people. There's no doubt about it. There's a history of some bad stuff that happened in our industry, but that was a long time ago when people didn't realize how important the human-animal connection is and how you don't have to be mean to animals. You get much more and much better and a much healthier, happier, and safer animal when you love them. In the file, I read... Um a reference that the entire family employs or employed the technique of gentle training. Yeah, it's, it's the same method that you use on children. It's positive reinforcement. But there is, you know, uh, admittedly, when there's a positive, there must be a negative. So the negative is, what are you doing? That's about all it takes. Because they're so, if you're not always constantly on a child and, and, or on an animal and being mean and being <laughs> vicious and blah, blah, blah. when you do blah, 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 it doesn't mean anything after a while, you know. But if you're sensitive with them and you have a, a relationship where you have mutual respect and you, they like you, they love you, you get a lot more with, come here, there's a good boy, what a good, you, that was great, you know. Now, I do see people overdoing it with children, you know. I mean, it's really annoying. <laughs> oh, you're so brilliant. Look what you did. You put your shoes on. You're eight years old. Good boy. <laughs> Not such a trick, huh? Oh, he's out of diapers. He's five years old. We just got him out of diapers. Going good. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's not overdo the niceness. Let's have a little respect and a little discipline and acknowledge good behavior, but let's not be ridiculous. So, so it sounds like it, it has to do with the tone of voice. It is. It's all how you comport yourself. Can you it. hear a tone of voice in the cats? Oh, yeah, big time. So and you know when you that snarl is a serious... You, it's not only that. It's their whole body language, you know. They, they have a whole way of moving when they're nasty and when they're not happy with you. And they will... You hurt them, they will hurt you. You know, I... I uh, 
I've experienced it where I was a little, not even hurt, physically hurting them, but just, what do you, you know, not nice. Right. And they're like, meh, you know, <laughs> bite you too, you know. Um, and it works, you know. They do that. They, you have to, what we do is we avoid the nastiness. We don't let things go that far. You know, if I'm working with an animal and he starts to get a little hyper or nervous or not paying attention, they forget about it. Let him go home, let him relax, go over, talk to them, give him some treats, I've, you know, let him know it's okay, you know. Half of the time, the next time you go to back to the same thing, they forgot the bad stuff and remember the good stuff. Well, in that list of animals that I read that you and your siblings have mm -hmm. trained or are working with now, in addition to the big cats, there's horses and dogs and right. chimps and right. bears. Right. But the one that interests me, being a farm kid, are the racing pigs. Oh, well, that's now, Wayne, yeah, yeah. Can that's, you really train a pig? No, it's food. It's food. It's cookies. It's, oh. It's, you know, positive reinforcement means treats, and it, which means bribery, really. It's just a form of bribery. And uh, pigs love Oreo cookies. So they, <laughs> they get uh, their regular feed. They don't, you don't have to withhold food because it's not the normal food. It's a treat. I it's the same with dogs. I mean, if you have a dog... And we always encourage people to teach animals. They love to learn, expands your, their mental uh, ability, and it makes your relationship because you're giving them time. Yeah. You know, it's like your kids. You can't just say, go play your video game or watch TV. you got to say, come on, let's go. Do something together. Yeah, yeah. let's learn something or, you know. Um, again, in the file I read that you didn't, though, while you were performing, employ food or treats. I did towards the end of my career, just because I wanted people to see that that's how we do it. I was one of the first ones that changed the way you do cats. I was one of the early ones to have a, uh, there were other people that had microphones, but they didn't really explain anything. And I always wanted people to know that every animal that I ever had had a name, they had a personality, they have moods, they have character. Some of them are funny on purpose. You know, I put that into the show by wearing, you know, I, as soon as Madonna had the cordless mic, I got one. <laughs> and I did shows, and the first time, the first few times I went in with them, the producer would say, well, I don't know about this microphone thing. Let's not, uh, you know, I didn't know about that. And I would say, just watch, you know, watch and see and see what you like, you know. I'm going to do it anyway, by the way. But uh, that's what I do now. And uh, it made a huge difference. And there was not one of them ever said, sorry, but can you lose the mic? None of them. Because it opened up a whole world for the audience to realize that all this stuff that the animal rights people say isn't necessarily all true. Right. That we do have an affection for our animals, that they are part of our family. And, and you know, and these people have no common sense whatsoever. My dad made his living basically with one horse. Okay, we didn't have extra horses to haul around all the world. Tony didn't have a stunt double. No. <laughs> and do you think that horse ever slept a night that my dad wasn't aware where he slept, what he was sleeping on, who was watching him, where, you know, yeah. what he had eaten, had he drank? We take phenomenal care of our animals. Well, I want And that's the part that hurts us because they act like we don't care. And the problem is, is that the people that do care about animals, the people that are animal welfare and not animal rights, that believe in saving animals, giving them the best quality we can now for, with what we have, those are the people that are getting the least amount of the, the support. The animal rights activists, the, the biggest way of helping animals seems to be euthanasia. And I talk about this in my, in my at our place because that we have no voice you know they have millions of dollars they're raising money on tv under false pretenses most of them and uh very little of the money goes to help animals i think it's less than one percent of the millions that they raise they pay themselves huge salaries the the biggest guy i think he gets seven fifty seven hundred and fifty thousand a year these are the people on tv with the little dog in the crate and the sad music and uh, 17 million in their own retirement fund. And just, it was in USA Today during the summer that they have $26 million in an offshore account in the Cayman Islands. Well, it seems to me that if they have that kind of money laying around, why don't they have free spay and neuter clinics everywhere? Why are we killing puppies and kittens? Why aren't we doing better for the environment? Why aren't we supporting 
places where animals are starving and they won't drop hay, you know. We, we've interfered with nature, now we have to manage it. Well, <laughs> I want to turn our conversation to uh, Big Cat. Uh, but before we do, this would be a good time to jot down your questions. And then Maureen, um, if you just raise your hand, Maureen will gather those cards and uh, compile uh, two, three, or four for us to close the program with for Kay. Um, so if you would like to do that now. Um, in 1987, mm -hmm. you started on your current mission. And it all actually came about by accident. My dad happened to be home that summer and a couple of guys bought a tiger that they were gonna to take to a different country. And they didn't have any paperwork. I, I don't know what they thought, but they thought they were just gonna buy the tiger and take it to another country. Were they performers? I don't think so. I, don't, I never got a name. I don't think they were, I don't know what they were. Okay. I, I don't, I, we didn't really ask. They, and my dad called me and said, there's these guys here and they've got this tiger and they have nowhere to leave it, and can you think they can leave it with us for a couple of weeks? And we talked about it, and I said, I don't know why not. Well, apparently they never got the paperwork because it was probably an unregistered, you know, every animal is registered. They are highly regulated, which is a good thing. So um, they never came back. Weeks went by, and they never came back, and we ended up keeping him for, like, his life. Yeah. And that was so the start. That was the beginning. And I, I actually had to pay people to come and take care of them when I was on the road because I was still performing most of the year. And I would have somebody at my place to come in and take care of them. So in the ensuing years, it snowballed. Where, it snowballed. Um, where do most of the big cats come from? Originally, there were a lot of illegal pet owners. You know, people that they want... They, People think if they get a tiger cub, it's going to be like this cute little club, club, club for, uh, cub for years. It's just going to be cute in the house. It's going to take years to grow up. Well, they grow almost a pound a day, a little less than a pound a day. So in a short amount of time, you have a very large, dangerous animal. And then they start to panic. And what am I going to do? And it's eating a lot. And uh, safety issues come up. And if it's been taken illegally... It, they're very, re you know, they don't really want to let you know because... So you don't, don't ask so. questions. Well, we, you, we originally you. we did. We used to put it on our website and we got in trouble over it because these guys felt embarrassed, you know, and uh, so we decided, they said if they'd have known, they'd have euthanized them rather than be embarrassed. So we realized then that we can't discuss where they came from, just give them a home, take care of them. It doesn't matter where they come from. Right. A lot of them come from photo ops. I, re I, will I read say about that. that. A lot of them are from photo ops where they, you'll see them at a flea market or somewhere taking pictures with a cub. And those are surplus. And they used to euthanize them or disappear them. Well, now everything is tracked and registered. And so now they have to find a home. And we, we don't ask too many questions. We just, you know. So right now, how many, how many big cats do you have? Mm, I think we have, a, we just did an inventory. We have a lot of animals. <laughs> <laughs> About over 40, I think. 40? And then yeah. what other animals? You have 40 big cats? 14 bears. Uh, we have primates, a whole aviary, a lot of hoof stock. Um, tons of, well, we also added a petting zoo, which we, my sister had goats, so I got some of her goats. So we have a really, and we have emus. We got the one from Fruitville Road last year. Remember when the emu was running around Fruitville Road? It's at the habitat. We just took in a kangaroo named Jack last year. So whatever comes up, originally my idea was every time I went to some little terrible roadside zoo, they'd say abused circus animal rescued. And I would say, what circus, what's the name of the animal and who owned it? Oh, we don't know. Uh, we don't. Well, you have to know because there are records. So they would use the circus to malign uh, the circus in order to raise money to take care of the tiger that they probably bought at an exotic cat auction or even online you can buy them. Used to be able to buy them online. And so I used to get so furious because I know the animal people. There, there have been, as I said, right. obviously, but um, most of them keep them because just like we are, they love their animals, they've had them their whole life. They're not gonna just turn them loose, you know, or, or yeah. put them somewhere. They keep them till they pass. Um, 
So very few of the animals that we have are circus, circus animals. animals. Yeah, very few. The, um, uh, again, from the files, um, and it was, it, 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 it was sort of a brief reference that you made um, about the property itself, the size of the property, right. um, which we can talk about in a bit. But um, you also made a reference to a lot of Sarasota's circus families had larger properties. Right. Uh, and that... Well, unfortunately, what happened was during the early part of my career, we still had a lot of circus people that lived in this town. And you'd see trailers and riggings up in people's yards and animals in the back. And, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of circus people that lived here. Well, what happened was the town started to get pretty famous. Beautiful town, great life here. Realtors come in, developers come in. They don't want trailers around. They don't want rigging or animals. So while we were all the circus people away on tour, they would change all the laws in the communities that they had in. So they would come home and just like you said about the earlier about your home, the, yeah. the deed restrictions. So all of a sudden they have nowhere to put their rigging. They can't have the trailer in the yard, you know. So many of them have... have uh, but you have away. 30 acres. Yeah. Luckily we could use 100 more. <laughs> you know, I always think bigger. I, I know right now there are there's a place in um, in Ghana and in uh, some parts of um, the world where they have uh, 500 orangutans that they've saved, little little orangutan babies, and they they have 500. The parents have obviously been eaten or hunted. The bush meat market is terrible over there. People are starving. They have no way to put those 500 orangutans. There's no, there's no way. Are you thinking about bringing them here? I'm thinking Florida. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking inland, 20,000 20, acres of uh, habitat for exotic animals. We certainly have to do something because the wild is going away. Right. And one of the things, you know, that we talk about is where you put your money if you have money. Unfortunately, most circus people live a very artistic life. And uh, that includes not thinking about the future, I think. <laughs> so, uh, but it is important to save what we can of our history. And we should, it should include animals. The business that we do now is legal. We're not doing anything illegal when we work with animals, but they're banning that now as we speak. But Sarasota so it's has changing the whole flavor of this area and the country as a whole. Sarasota had to grow up around those 30 acres. I mean, oh yeah, oh yeah. We used to get letters almost daily to try to buy our land, you know. But that was never. We never bought it as an investment. We bought it as a place to live, and with the animals there, we we're there for a long time as long as we have animals. And you know, the 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 strangest thing is is that. When we first started taking in animals, nobody wanted them. They had no value. You could get a, a lion for $50, you know. Now suddenly there are no lions. They're not being born healthy in this country. Uh, we have 3,200 wild tigers in the entire wild. We probably have more in this country in captivity. Now there are a group of us actually forming an alliance and part of our project is going to be DNA. We're going to do DNA on all the cats that are privately owned because the zoos don't have enough to reproduce uh, generations of tigers. They just aren't there. They've neutered many of them. Many of them are inbred. There'll, there'll be a brother and sister somewhere, so they implant them. So they're not viable DNA. They call it the species survival plan, but it's a very, you know, I don't know about the DNA, and I know that there's plenty of DNA left in this country, and that's what we need to be focusing on now is bringing animals here and saving animals and breeding out. We're not going to have them. They're going to be gone. They're gonna, it's just like the elephants. They've culled them so much, and the poachers have done so much damage. And because it takes two years to produce an elephant, and, and the chances of survival are slight because of the poachers killing the parents, that we need to have captive breeding programs all in places in the world that aren't being used. That's, we should think about that, you know. And that's why I like the Nature Conservancy, because they are trying to save some of the wild areas. Yeah. Well, we have some interesting questions from our audience. Uh, the first is, what happened uh, to the cat that attacked you? Did she stay in the act? Yeah, I worked her the whole rest of the year, and she was getting up there. Uh, she was probably 15 or 16, and I worked her for the rest of the year, and then I retired her. Because okay. it was an indication that she wasn't really having a great time. 
it's time to hang yeah. it up. <laughs> and uh, you kind of have to know that. You, you know, it's hard to retire animals because, believe it or not, if you take them out of the show, they deteriorate really quickly. They, yeah. lose, they just kind of, it's like retired people. It's not a good idea. Yeah. You have to stay functional. Stay active. Yeah. Um, we touched on this a little earlier, but um, uh, a lot of the, the animals um, that your family trained, I think, w would be viewed as domestic dogs sort and, and of, horses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was there a moment when you decided you wanted to go with the, the wild animal or the dangerous animal or the... Yes. I was on a show in California uh, in the early 70s, and I, there was a lion act on the show, and it was quite possibly one of the worst animal acts I'd ever seen. It wasn't that he was mean or anything like that. It was just not good, and, it, you know, it was just not very entertaining, and... And they were so beautiful, and I've always loved cats. I, yeah. you know, I, to me, a male lion is gorgeous, and we happen to have a really gorgeous one, handsome, our movie guy. He's absolutely breathtaking. If you haven't seen him, he's worth the trip. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just that, I think, that drew me mo more to it than the whole idea. Uh, and, of course, an, a funny story, too. There was a lady named, um, oh... I can't think of her name, but uh, she was, she was a, apparently her boyfriend was a gangster, and she had a lion act, and she had limousines, and she had a crew, and uh, <laughs> she had uh, all fur coats and diamonds, and she, she was kind of a crazy lady, but she had a, an amazing lion act. And I thought, that's woman's making a living. I'm a, I might do that. You, know? <laughs> you didn't know about the gangster no, part. No, and then, huh? I, then I found out later that it was because her boyfriend was a member of the mafia or something. And, and he was footing the bill, you know. I was like, geez. Um, you now teach other people how to train their animals, right? Well, I, I haven't really. I taught one young man because he became part of our family. And unfortunately, he was taken in a car accident. But... He's the only one that I've really... I mean, I have, uh, you know, Blake Willender's very interested in cats, and uh -huh. he comes around, and we have a couple of our own crew uh, that take care of the animals that are interested and very learning uh -huh. by being around it. But my son, uh, he's been working with the cats. He actually started... As soon as he could get a... As soon as we could find a tuxedo his size, he had a job. <laughs> and he was about this big. He was... I think he was seven or eight years old when he started. And he would open the doors for me and so he's the ninth generation yeah. Rosaire yeah. and the tenth generation is my would be my grandson and granddaughter I've won four and won six and Clayton has a connection with the animals too and I think you can't just say I'm going to be an animal trainer I think there has to be some kind of a, a thing I don't they choose you that's why not everybody can be animal trainers not every aerialist is going to be an animal trainer it doesn't, doesn't although there have been a few that have been able to do both but in some cases they didn't actually do the training they're just presenting an act that somebody else has trained well I keep checking my time here because I don't want um, we only have about like a few okay. minutes left on the right. card so um, I want to close um, and give you an opportunity uh, to tell us about the annual animal extravaganza oh, yeah. and what's coming up in 2015 that uh, the the extravaganza. It's this is actually our tenth anniversary anniversary of doing it. Yeah, so it's kind of exciting, and it was just an idea that that we had as a family because you know everybody knocks animal shows and, uh, but I tell you what, we pack that tent. They it is very very popular. We get people emailing us all year long. When is it? What's gonna? Wh you know what are the dates? And it's amazing. And one of the reasons we did it was because Circus Sarasota wasn't having any animals. And we were kind of upset about it because they're real circus people. And we always, I always felt that they should have animals in the shows. And uh -huh. They have dogs and horses. But they, and the only exotic they've ever had was my cousin David's baboon, which we have now. <laughs> and uh, not the baboon, his show will be in our show because he's phenomenal. And... Uh, so we decided, well, why don't we just do the opposite? Let's just do all animals. No aerial, no silks, no hula hoops, no, <laughs> no Cirque du Soleil stuff, none of that. And uh, just do animals. And amazingly, it, it, it just people love it. And I, you can go to any show, and even during the la last few years of my career, 
any show that I was with that did really, really well, that had good crowds and people were happy, and, 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 and you do want to entertain them. You don't want them just to come and, and spend the money. You want them right. to have a good time and want to come back. Were shows that were heavy in the animals, and that's why Ringling and I applaud Feld for not giving in to the people and giving the audience what they actually want, which is animals. Animal acts. And you can see it every time you go to Ringling and the seats are full. It doesn't matter that there's 10 people that are misinformed outside dragging their dog on the concrete in the heat while they pick it to complain about the animals that are in the air-conditioned building getting the best possible care in the world. You know, when is the so animal it's a, it's extravaganza? A, it, that was one of the reasons we did it. It's gonna be, going to be this year. We're actually going to have a night for all of you folks that are here, uh, that know me, my friends, and thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to have a Friday night press show just for circus people and the, and the media. And then we're every Saturday and Sunday starting uh, January 24th. Okay. So it's every Saturday and Sunday till the 1st of March because it runs over. And there'll be two shows a day, 1.30 and 4.30, except February 1st is Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> so that was a big mistake the last couple of years. We did a 4.30 show, and it was like there were more people in the show than in the audience. So, so that one's out. But it, it's a great show, and if you love animals, it's, it, it's a little different every year, although the whole family has to be involved because that's what we love to do. It's a wonderful show. And surprisingly, uh, one of our biggest parts of the audience is, are the Amish people. We get tons of Amish and Mennonites. That's wonderful. There. Yeah, they, because they're connected to nature. They're like you said, you grew up on a farm. People that grow up on a farm and grow up around animals, it's sort of a natural part of their world. Yeah. And that's what we've always been stressing, you know. It, animals are a natural part of human life. We definitely are really connected and we should be. And if you don't have a pet, go rescue one. They're all over the place puppies and kittens and all different things and animals are really I can't imagine my life without them. Well uh, Kay, um, I think everybody here would like to thank you for keeping a part, a very important part of Sarasota's circus legacy alive. Oh I love it. And accessible and um, uh, it's, it's wonderful work that you're doing and we're very proud to have you here. Well thank you. Um, collecting Recollections uh, will now resume uh, later this winter and uh, so our next session is on February 2nd, and our guest will be Paul Binder, founder of New York's Big Apple Circus. So I hope you will all come and join us again then, and uh, join us immediately following the program. We won't be across the hall like we usually are, but uh, outside on the, uh, the terrace of the restaurant. And we'll gather there, and you'll have an opportunity to meet and greet uh, Kay and talk with her more. And my so son's here, Clayton's back there, <laughs> following our tradition. And, and I want to thank all of our friends, and I, some of our donors are here, and God bless you. Thank you so much. And, and the rest of you, remember, it's almost the end of the year. Good time to donate and get a tax deduction. <laughs> Don't forget the taxes. <coughs> thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you so much. Oh, it was a pleasure. Enjoy it.